So um, I'm going to be talking about infrastructure and tooling, but I realized before I get started with that, I should actually um, just give you a brief overview of what we do at Turnitin and Gradescope, since that's where I work. And uh, it might help you as you're talking to the people outside there to actually know what we do. So I'm going to do like five minutes on that. So there's a product called Revision Assistant that's part of Turnitin, and that gives students feedback on their writing. And the, the feedback is in the form of, um, you guys can see it, yeah. Uh, it's in the form of kind of detailed suggestions for how, how to improve their writing and not a grade. Like we, in general, we're very sensitive about the educational mission that we have, so we don't ever want to do something that students perceive as, um, I guess, bad for their education. We want to be on the side of the students and the side of the instructors, save instructors time, help students get better feedback. Uh, Revision Assistant helps us do that for essays. And this is from an acquisition of a company called Lightside Labs about five years ago. Uh, Turnitin's core mission is to detect when a student might have not submitted original writing. So that could take the form of just copying and pasting a Wikipedia article and then saying it's their work um, in an essay. Or it could take the form, increasingly, a form of cheating that was actually paying someone to write your essay for you. So it's not, it's original, like someone wrote it, it's a new piece of writing, but it wasn't the student who, who says it was their work. So Authorship Investigate is a product where we try to determine who the actual author of a piece of writing is. Uh, there's interesting machine learning to do there. I come from, I come to turn it in through an acquisition of a company I co-founded with Peter Abiel called Gradescope. And Gradescope is on the STEM side, so science, technology, engineering, math, and not the writing side. And what our kind of North Star metric is, is how much time do we save instructors without compromising the assessment quality. So for us, that means can we help instructors grade compl complex work, so complex student answers, not just multiple choice, in exactly the same way that they would grade on paper, right, in the best possible case, like paying a lot of attention giving detailed feedback and being accurate in the grading, but help them do that at scale um, using di di digitization of the paper-based workflows and machine learning on top of that. So for example, to group similar answers together or maybe to even watch an instructor grade and then grade the rest of the answers automatically. We have a bunch of, that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's stuff under the surface of the, of the ocean, so to speak. Uh, where machine learning plays uh, a big role. So we match submissions to roster automatically. We do some like old school computer vision, like align pages and extract the student ink. So everything is different from the template. We do multiple choice answer recognition really well. Um, we can split scans even if they have extra pages. And there's a bunch of these small problems that all have like a machine learning module that runs in production uh, at scale. So that's pretty cool. And then lastly, I want to talk about uh, a thing that we have going on in the writing side right now, which is citation extraction. There's actually not a good way to like parse out the spots where the writer says, you know, this fact is supported by this evidence. Um, those are you know called citations, and then match them to the corresponding reference line. So we now have a machine learning engine that can do that, and it enables a lot of other stuff kind of downstream of it, including for originality, but also to help students write better. Uh, one thing I'm excited about is the ability for instructors to share questions with other instructors. So you, you grade a question on Gradescope, and then very easily you can share it with other instructors who now have the question content and the rubric, and potentially what our model learned about how you graded that question, so that the next time, uh, or you know, the next instructor who uses your question is going to have to do less work than you did. So this is more just to kind of you know, if you're interested, come talk to me or, come, or uh, come talk to Don or Kenneth out there at the table. Okay, so the next part, the next module in this full stack deep learning uh, program is infrastructure and tooling. And I like to start with the motivation for like, I guess, my motivation. So my dream is to basically provide some data to the machine learning project, and then not have to do anything else, and get an optimal prediction system, so like the best possible prediction system for that data, 
uh, and I want to just deploy it on the web at massive scale or on a mobile app, like whatever I actually want to do with that. But I don't want to write any code. I don't want to debug models. I don't want to provision resources or buy GPUs. You know, th that's the dream. But in reality, what we have to do is, OK, first we've got to find the data, aggregate it, clean the data. There's a bunch of noisy stuff in there. Store it somewhere, uh, pay, you know, pay money to label it, version it. Then write our model code, probably debug it for many, many days or weeks. Uh, provision compute resources. OK, then finally run our experiments, store the results, test the model, deploy the model. And then we're not even done then. We have to monitor the predictions. And we close the data flywheel loop through the user interface work that we do. So the dream and the reality are, are not quite aligned right now. And an observation of this fact was made a few years ago by people at Google in a seminal paper that is called Machine Learning, the High Interest Credit Card of Technical Debt. And uh, in that paper, there's a striking figure that maybe you've seen in other places, which is basically, if you look at the machine learning system as a whole, the actual kind of model code, the part that is taught in um, you know, the uh, Andrew Ng's classes, fast.ai, stuff like that, uh, that part is actually quite small. And there's a lot of other code around it that configures the system, collects the data, labels the data, you know, extracts the features, uh, a lot of testing code provisions resources, serves it, monitors it. And that's kind of all around it. Uh, and you know, my dream was echoed recently in uh, Andre Karpathy's, who was a guest instructor at some point. But he gave a talk recently at PyTorch DEF CON. And basically, you know, at Tesla, they have the same goal, which is just add some data and then not do anything else, and then see their model improve. And they have their own stack for that. So it comes from data, GPU cluster, PyTorch training, evaluation, inference, and then um, shadow mode means like as the driver actually uh, drives and the system makes predictions, where do the predictions drift out of sync with what the driver does? So we can take that telemetry data, run it through something that maybe labels that data, then add it to the data set, and then that you know, forward pass should essentially not involve any machine learning scientists or engineers. So that's the goal. Um, to get to that goal, we have to get down into the weeds and see what all the components actually are. So broadly, I think we can think of things to do with data, things to do with the actual development and training and evaluation of the model, and then things to do with the deployment of the model. So data, you know, the first question is, is it going to be hard drive or cloud, or you know, local or cloud? How do we actually store it? You know, databases are a specific kind of method for storage. Uh, data processing, sometimes called data workflows. Labeling data and potentially versioning data that we get. For development and training evaluation, we have that same question. Are we on-prem or in the cloud? There's some basic software engineering that we just have to do, and there's tools that enable that and make us better at it. There's deep learning specific frameworks or machine learning specific frameworks. Particular, of particular interest is our ability to train in a distributed fashion that's either on multiple GPUs or on multiple GPUs on multiple machines. Uh, if we are trying to do that, we have to really get a handle on how we actually provision GPUs and manage them. When we run a bunch of experiments, we have to manage where they are stored and how we get visibility into what we've done and what we plan to do. And uh, a particular interest there is like, if we dialed in the architecture and the data set, we might still want to run a bunch of experiments that essentially tune the hyperparameters, like learning rate or the exact number of layers in your ConfNet. On the deployment side, once again, on-prem, or is it embedded system, or mobile, or in the web? Um, we have continuous integration and testing. This helps us not break things as we update our model. Web deployment has its own kind of set of tools. We know a lot about how to do it from deploying general web services. And maybe there's some specific things that we need to learn how to do for deep learning specifically. Monitoring predictions is another thing. And once again, there's things that we know how to do just monitoring web services. But potentially, there's something extra we should do for deep learning models. And uh, this question mark, by the way, uh, refers to things that I think are opportunities, or just I don't know of a field, or I don't know of a tool that fulfills the need that I see. So it could be interesting to think about. 
And then if we're deploying on embedded systems or mobile, um, there's things we may care about like interchange formats, uh, distilling our networks using specific frameworks for mobile. And then lastly, there's uh, an increasing number of startups and big companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon that try to make it just handle all of it for you. And some of you asked that uh, in the previous module, like what about these all-in-one machine learning tools? So we will talk about that as well. So in this specific module, we're going to talk about the infrastructure for development and training and evaluation of the model. And then we also have lectures coming up about the data side and about the deployment side. So I'll pause here for questions. So there's one question. Um, MLflow, is that for monitoring or what's that for? Uh, we'll talk about that. It'll, it'll be one of the tools. 